Hi, I'm Stuart from the Norfolk Honey Company and welcome to more Getting Started in Beekeeping. So welcome to the next video in the Getting Started series. These are designed for the beginner beekeeper, for those of you who haven't yet got bees and are thinking about getting bees, and for anyone that's really looking to perhaps have a bit of a refresher uh, before we get into the new season. Today we're going to look at uh, one of the aspects of beekeeping that can cause a lot of beekeepers a lot of strife and worry and that's swarming and swarming is really the only way that a honeybee colony can reproduce obviously the queen reproduces workers and drones and uh, virgin queens but in order for a colony to uh, reproduce and create a second viable colony is by swarming and it's something that uh, we can work with it's something that we can with a bit of effort um, prevent um, but it's something fundamentally that we as beekeepers all suffer from at some point or other despite our best efforts and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how swarming happens uh, why it happens uh, things that we can do to prevent swarming and uh, what you can do to uh, collect a swarm perhaps uh, your bees have swarmed into uh, an area that you can uh, get to maybe a tree or a gatepost or something like that and we'll talk about how you can collect that swarm, house them and uh, create a second colony for no cost at all. So let's get started. If you haven't already subscribed please do hit the subscribe button. I'd love to have you along uh, with us for the coming season. Uh, I'm getting really excited now about uh, the new beekeeping season approaching and as the days lengthen and hopefully the weather warms up uh, we'll start to see bees flying and uh, we can soon get into inspecting again. So as I've already mentioned swarming is the natural process by which a honeybee colony reproduces and swarming can be caused by a number of factors some of which we understand and I suspect that there's some that we don't yet understand uh, however um, one of the factors that we can impact upon uh, when a colony swarms is the amount of room that they have as the season kicks off and the honeybee colony starts to grow if we've got them in a brood box that we've overwintered and we're not watching them closely what can happen is the brood nest can expand so rapidly that they start to become overcrowded and run out of room and that can be a major trigger for uh, honeybee swarming so what we need to do in the spring is once we get into the colony and we start inspecting we need to make sure that we're giving them sufficient room to expand now that could be that we are giving them extra brood frames it could be that it's a nucleus colony that we're moving into a full-size hive or it might be that we've got a full-size colony and we're adding supers and getting them ready for honey production in the spring but whatever happens if we don't give them sufficient room then that can really be a major trigger for swarming another factor uh, that could cause swarming is that maybe the queen is becoming older and uh, less viable as the egg laying machine of the colony and so the colony may decide that it's time to produce new queens and in producing uh, queen cells it may be that they decide that they're going to swarm and it's always the old queen that leaves with the main initial swarm and we call that initial swarm a prime swarm and it tends to be the largest swarm that will come from a beehive and uh, it can be the most devastating in terms of uh, beekeeping and uh, any expected honey crop that you're going to get for the year. So in terms of the timing of swarms you won't find that you'll have any swarming happening over the winter and that's because there are no drones in the colony so all of the drones have been kicked out uh, in the late autumn and winter period uh, predominantly there will always be exceptions in perhaps warmer climates but generally here in the UK certainly it will be very rare that you find drones 
going through the whole of the winter in a colony. It has happened in milder times, uh, but if we have very cold weather, then the poor old drones get kicked out of the colony. So, uh, in order for the virgin queens to be able to become successfully mated queens heading up a colony, they need drones. So in the spring, one of the first indicators that bees are preparing to swarm is the appearance of drone cells. And these are very obvious when you compare them to worker cells. They're larger, uh, they have a raised dome on them, and you should be able to spot them fairly easily. And that should trigger a thought process that okay so the colony is producing drones and I need to start thinking that the colony might be preparing to swarm. Not in every case but certainly in the majority of colonies once drones appear we're looking at the potential for swarming. And this can happen as early as the beginning of March. We've had drone cells appearing late February, early March and if we get a very mild warm spring then I've had uh, swarms coming from colonies as early as late March and the beginning of April. So it's something that you need to be prepared for. And the second main indicator of uh, a swarming process happening, particularly early in the season, is the appearance of rudimentary queen cells. Now these appear as, um, I guess the best way to describe them is if you take an acorn and you remove the actual acorn from the little cup at the back end of the acorn, um, whatever, whatever that's called, um, if you throw away the acorn you're left with a tiny little cup and the rudimentary queen cups appear as those little cups and you will find them starting to appear across the, the colony and if we're looking at swarming, they generally tend to appear on the bottom of the frames. Now these remain as rudimentary queen cups. It appears that the workers are preparing and learning how to produce queen cells and then eventually what will happen is you'll find that eggs will appear in those queen cups and then once we have eggs in them the uh, cup is drawn into a longer larger cell and that becomes the queen cell. So if you remember back to the session we had on the various castes within the beehive you'll recall that uh, the development of the queen happens in various stages so an egg is placed into the queen cup and it remains as an egg for three days and then that changes from egg into larvae and it remains as uh, larvae in an open cell for a further five days and the cell is then sealed and that's quite critical to us as beekeepers and it's why we tend to inspect at least every seven days because if you have a queen cell that appears in your beehive the day after you've inspected if you then go back a week later and inspect you should find an open queen cell rather than a sealed queen cell and that can be quite critical in terms of swarming because once the queen cell is sealed it's very likely that the bees will then start to swarm depending on the development of the queen cell some bees will swarm sooner rather than later but it appears to be pretty much always when the queen cell has been sealed that's when the bees will swarm so you need to try to uh, manage that process prior to the queen cell being sealed and that's why we would tend to inspect at least uh, every seven days. So we're not really too sure uh, who triggers the swarming process but generally what happens is the workers will um, force the queen to slim down by uh, reducing the amount of food that she gets she'll stop laying eggs and that means that her abdomen will uh, shrink slightly and then allow her to fly out of the beehive and at that point once the queen cell is sealed uh, you are likely to lose uh, a prime swarm. Now the prime swarm is the first swarm that emanates from a colony that's produced queen cells and so 
you could lose up to half of the colony in one fell swoop and that will be the largest swarm that comes out uh, they'll fly around the apiary gathering themselves and they'll land on uh, maybe a tree or a bush uh, cluster together and then scouts will go out to locate uh, a new position for them and if you're lucky they might find an old hive in your apiary uh, but more often than not they'll find somewhere else to fly off to and if you're not around when that happens they'll disappear over the fence over over the trees and uh, will never be seen again and that can be quite soul destroying because you work hard to get the bees through the winter you build them up in the early spring and then in one fell swoop your colony is reduced to half its size but that's not necessarily the end of the story you will be told and you'll read that the first queen that emerges from the queen cells will then travel around the beehive and her and the workers will then destroy any remaining queen cells that are in the colony or if any other subsequent queens have emerged that they will fight and uh, one will kill the other until there's only one virgin queen left in the colony well that's not always the case so what can happen is the prime swarm leaves the colony and then you're left with a half sized colony a virgin queen emerges and then swarms so you have half of what's left will then leave with the first virgin queen that emerges and if that continues these subsequent casts the subsequent smaller swarms will gradually reduce the amount of bees that you've got left in your colony until uh, I've uh, the, there have been instances where I've only had maybe a cup full of bees left lots of brood lots of frames with no bees on and lots of open queen cells and it's something that um, will completely wipe out a, a beehive uh, in one fell swoop so if you're planning holidays you need to make sure that uh, you've got uh, someone that can maybe take a look at your beehive that you're going away for a, a short period and you know that you can inspect uh, before you go and then immediately on your return or it's possible that uh, while you're away you're going to suffer um, maybe a prime swarm or possibly the worst case scenario is that you'll suffer the prime swarm and then subsequent casts from that colony and you'll return to find that the beehive is almost empty it is possible of course that um, you might find the prime swarm and subsequent casts uh, that have come from the colony uh, in your apiary in your back garden uh, again I've had instances uh, where we attended a, a beehive that had swarmed uh, we were able to capture the prime swarm and subsequently over a period of several hours uh, we were called back to contend with yet more swarms and they became fewer and fewer in number so it was uh, it was quite an interesting event because we ended up with something like three or four swarms coming from the one colony but the uh, the final swarm that came out of the hive was barely a, a pint sized glass full and then you bring into doubt the viability of such casts and whether or not they're actually going to be able to survive once the numbers of bees that, that swarm reduce to such a small number it's very often the case that uh, despite your best efforts uh, they won't build up in time if you get them early enough in the season then it's possible that you could put them into a new box and uh, feed them and build them up so that they become a viable colony by the end of the season but it does take uh, a lot of effort and a considerable amount of investment in them uh, and sometimes that's just not worth it so one of the main issues with swarming is that it hugely reduces the uh, effectiveness of that colony to produce honey and here in this chart you can see we've got the colony building up nicely in the spring the number of bees is increasing uh, rapidly through the spring and then in may we suffer a swarm and we lose a significant number of bees the the numbers on this chart are, are purely representative they 
they're not actual numbers but you could potentially lose more than half of the bees so you could find that there's a, a more dramatic drop in the colony numbers post swarming um, however this represents quite nicely the effect that swarming has on your colony so here you can see the main foraging period between May and August and we've got the bees out foraging on lots of plants and normally if you could prevent the swarming you'd have upwards of 50 to 60,000 bees in the colony with a, a high proportion of those bees out foraging and that would give you a really nice honey crop but then if you suffer a swarm and you deplete your colony let's say by maybe a third to a half then that honey crop is just going to disappear and the bees might recover sufficiently to provide you with a small amount of honey but any large amount of honey that you would have hoped to have achieved and of course any splits any divisions any increases that you'd planned will all be put on hold because you will have lost a huge number of bees from your colony. One of the other aspects of swarming is that if you have your beehives in an urban area and they're uh, perhaps in your back garden and you're in a, a relatively high population area, swarming can be a nuisance and quite frightening to non-beekeepers, to uh, your neighbours that uh, back onto your property uh, you could find that it causes some distress to them. So from a responsible beekeeper perspective it's also quite important that we try to prevent our bees from swarming. So we need to think about ways that we can prevent swarming and uh, as I've already mentioned one of those ways is to provide the bees with plenty of room so that not only can they build up their brood nest area but that they've also got somewhere that they can store the nectar that they're bringing back. Another aspect of uh, swarm prevention is that we try to make sure that where the queen is becoming older that we don't hang on to her for too long that we replace the aging queens because what will happen is gradually her queen pheromone will start to subside and that could well trigger a swarming response from the bees. We do have a process called supersedure, which can also take place, and we'll talk about that in the session about queens. But generally speaking, if we're talking about the springtime and an aging queen, then it's likely that that will trigger a swarming response. One of the things that is key to uh, preventing a swarm is to know what to do if you happen to start seeing queen cells. And there are lots of things that we can do in an effort to prevent swarming and uh, we'll cover some of those off in a moment. Some beekeepers like to mark and clip their queens and by clipping uh, what they do is uh, they use a pair of uh, fine scissors to just snip off a section of one of the wings and that prevents the queen from being able to fly and the effect of this is that when the bees go out to swarm the workers will will come out of the hive and then the queen will will come out to fly but because she's got a clipped wing uh, generally what happens is she will either spiral down to the floor or just fall from the hive onto the floor. If the workers that have already swarmed don't have a queen with them then they'll come back to the to the hive. Now this is effective but only for a certain period of time because if the old queen goes back into the hive then all well and good. If she doesn't then it could be if you haven't inspected that the first virgin queen to emerge could be taken as a prime swarm and then they'll disappear with half the colony and then the swarming process just happens as normal but with the virgin queen. So it's important that if you do clip your queen's wings that you still inspect on a regular basis. Personally I don't clip the wings of my queens, uh, I don't think it's necessary. I try to get into the bees every seven days at least and uh, to be honest if I lose a swarm uh, then I put it down to my own beekeeping incompetence that I didn't happen to spot all the uh, queen cells uh, but the bees can be quite crafty they can hide queen cells uh, in little nooks and crannies within the colony that you don't always see so it's important that uh, when you spot one queen cell that you do a thorough inspection and uh, we'll cover that off once the season gets going but it Generally speaking, if you're not going to use the queen cells and you want to prevent a swarm, 
then what you would do is you would shake all of the bees off each frame in turn and remove all of the queen cells that you see. I have had an instance where one colony produced 57 queen cells. Uh, we counted them as we removed them all and uh, a week later we went back and they'd still managed to hide a queen cell in amongst some drone cells and they still swarmed. So despite our best efforts, the colony still disappeared. So you don't always get it right, uh, and the bees sometimes win the day, but uh, that's just beekeeping for you. So the ways that you can prevent swarming uh, are many, and uh, there's probably as many different ways of preventing swarming as there are beekeepers, and everyone has their own personal favorite way of doing it. We've produced videos to show artificial swarming, and the method of reducing the colony down into two colonies uh, and uh, in effect producing a swarm but housing them in a beehive. You can use uh, a method uh, called splitting and you'll hear people talk about splits and that's where you would split the, the colony, take frames out, put them into nuke boxes and move the bees around so that you've uh, left yourself with maybe a nuke box that contains a single queen cell uh, and another nucleus box that contains the old queen and uh, again we've got a video where we split a parent colony down into two nucleus colonies and still retaining the old parent colony. We produced that video last year and despite doing the splitting uh, the parent colony still managed to swarm so it doesn't always work and you have to be mindful that the parent colony could still uh, swarm. We were still left with two nucleus colonies plus the parent colony but that also had a new queen in it and that's where nuke boxes or a nucleus box comes into its own and I highly recommend that if you are just getting started or you're about to get started that you invest in at least one if not two or three nucleus boxes that you can use to perform some of the splits and tricks that you might need to use in order to prevent swarming and certainly if you're looking to expand the number of colonies then a nuke is certainly uh, an excellent way of increasing the colonies that you've got uh, with no extra cost to you. Nucleus colonies are becoming more and more expensive. Here in the UK anything from 150 to 250 pounds for a nucleus colony uh, is not unheard of and looking on the internet that seems to be the going rate for uh, 2017 and so if you want to increase then why not take the colony that you've got and simply split it. Or if you're starting up this year, then just get one or two nukes, build them up this summer, and then you can split them uh, mid to late summer and take two or more nucleus colonies through the winter next year. And then the following year in spring of 2018, you'll have two to four strong overwintered nukes that you can then put into full-size colonies and you've got that increase. So if we think in terms of how to prevent a, a swarming process, if you imagine that a colony is made up of three parts for the sake of swarming, we have the queen, we've got the brood, and we've got the flying bees. Now those are the three constituent parts that we need to consider when we're looking at making splits and dividing the colony to prevent swarming. And the idea is that you move two of those away from one and that will prevent swarming. So let's consider what I've just said. So what we need to do is to think about the swarming process and what happens with the swarming process. So we have a queen that flies away with potentially half the colony leaving the brood behind. And so if we can separate those before they swarm, then swarming's not going to happen. So for instance, the flying bees won't swarm without the queen. So let's consider that. We've got uh, a swarm that's going to fly away with the flying bees and the queen, leaving the brood behind. So if we can separate those, then it means that we're going to successfully prevent the swarming process. So in an artificial swarm, we actually remove the queen and the flying bees 
from the brood and so to all intents and purposes we've actually created an artificial swarm, hence the name, by placing the queen and the flying bees in a box without the brood. Likewise if you were to remove the queen perhaps to a nuke box with some brood and a few nurse bees, all of the flying bees will go back to the original position but they won't have a queen. So if you've got queen cells and you want to make an increase then you could keep perhaps the older queen in a nuke box with some bees to attend her and the brood that you've got but all the flying bees will go back to the original position where you've got all of the existing brood. Now that brood will emerge and if you don't have any queen cells but you've got eggs in that hive then the bees will produce queen cells from those eggs and then you can remove all bar one of those queen cells and a new queen will emerge, be mated and then become the head of that colony. And that can work really well for you if you're a backyard beekeeper with just one or two colonies and you don't want to have a significant increase then what you can do is you can make a split such as the artificial swarm or whichever method you choose for you and once you've got the new queen you can then destroy the old queen and unite the two colonies together and that can be really effective in replacing the queen in your colony without having to have lots of additional equipment and it's something that we're going to have a go at as the new season progresses. So what happens once you've lost a swarm out of the beehive? Uh, as we've said the existing colony will produce a new virgin queen and she'll go off and mate and come back to the colony. If you're lucky enough to find the swarm in your apiary or in your back garden uh, or in the neighbour's garden as it turns out then you can collect that swarm and then place them into either a nuke box or a hive uh, and make an increase from them. So the process is fairly straightforward. It might look quite scary to the uninitiated and it's always quite an exciting event if people are watching a swarm being collected. First of all, when the bees swarm, it's not some aggressive process. The bees are not looking to chase around stinging people. What happens is the flying bees will fill their honey crop with honey. So they've got some stores for when they find their new home and they switch on a wax building process. So if you can collect those bees, install them into a new hive, then they are primed and ready to produce wax and will produce a lot of wax and build out a foundation on new frames very very quickly. The process is, is quite straightforward. We Let's pretend that the bees are on a low hanging branch. Uh, they will form a torpedo shape uh, maybe the size of a rugby ball, an American football, or maybe uh, twice the size of that if they're a large swarm. And you simply shake them into a box and lay them on the floor, upturned, so that the bees can hang from the inside of the box. And if the queen is inside that box, then the bees will migrate back to that box. So if you leave it for a while, all the bees will go into that box and you can then simply pick up the box, fold the, the top down, and then you've got the bees inside the box. And then once you've got the bees inside the box, you can take them back to a hive. And there are two methods really. You can take the top off the beehive and shake them straight into uh, a brood box, replace the frames, and then pop the crime board and the roof back on. Or you can use a method where you place a board and a sheet up to the front entrance of the hive and you simply shake the bees onto the board and the, what will happen is the bees will run up the board and go into the hive and once they establish that that's where they want to be then the rest of the honeybees will turn up the board and march into the hive and it's a fantastic sight, it's a fascinating sight to see and one that I thoroughly recommend because it's a process that you just wouldn't believe happens until you see it with your own eyes and uh, again if we collect a swarm 
uh, in the coming season we'll produce a video and try and show exactly what happens when the bees march up the board and into a beehive. But of course if this is your first season in beekeeping then it might seem quite a, a daunting process to collect a swarm. So I would always suggest if you can maybe make contact with another local more experienced beekeeper and ask that if they are called out to a swarm that you can accompany them and assist and watch what happens and learn the process first but if you do find yourself in a position where your own bees have swarmed and you need to do something quickly then suit up grab a cardboard box and and give it a go i think you'll find the process is actually a lot easier than it might seem and once you've collected your first swarm and housed them you'll find that uh, you'll get called out to lots more swarms and you'll have the confidence to be able to collect them okay so that's it for our swarming session i hope you find that interesting please do hit the subscribe button and don't forget to leave lots of comments down in the space below and uh, give us a thumbs up and we'll catch up next time when we're going to be talking about the honeybee queen thanks for watching